Let's pray first. Lord God, you have um, you've entrusted your people with your word. You've entrusted the church with your word and with the truth. And we are the salt and we are the light of the world. And if we don't expose falsehood, nobody's going to. God, help us to take that charge. Help us to, to, to accept that charge and to do the hard work to refuting this falsehood that's, that's upsetting so many things. God, give us the victory over this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, we were talking about that passage in 2 Corinthians uh, 10 where it says that we, our weapons are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, etc. Right, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And um, I think that that passage is often used in terms of personal spiritual warfare. But uh, I really think that there is there's an aspect of that that's apologetic in nature. That we take ideas that are against that that uh, that present themselves as against the knowledge of God. And we as the church take God's word and we refute them. And we, we break them down. We tear them down. So I think it's, it's our responsibility to do this. And I think last week I mentioned that verse in Titus where it says that the, the false teachers during the time were, were upsetting whole families and their mouths must be stopped. And, uh, and this is a great example of, of a false teaching that that's upsetting not only whole families, but entire societies. I mean, it's been used by Satan to destroy whole countries for 200 years or more. And uh, I don't think he's going to let go of that easily. But I do think that, cause this, this being the last sh session that we do on this, uh, at least in learning and leading, I, don't, I, I want this to be a beginning, really. I want this to be a beginning of a conversation and uh, beginning of a of just working together to solve this thing as a church. And um, I would love it if you guys kept sending me your stuff. Um, I love that. And and talking about conversations that you have with people. And um, so let's not just make this a class, right? Let's let's make this let's let's take on this responsibility uh, that 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 God has given us to to destroy this thing. And um, you know, I'll tell you guys a story. During the, um, after the Russian Revolution happened and the, the Communist Revolution in Russia, they fought a civil war and there was, a, there was the Red Army who were the communists and there was the White Army who were, uh, I don't want to call them the good guys. They were, the, they were in many ways just as bad as the, as the Reds. And uh, but they were the ones who were fighting the communists. And uh, part of the reason why the Red Army won and the White Army lost was that, well, I mean, there's a mul uh, multiple reasons, but the Red Army uh, took the cities. The communists had taken the cities, and those were the centers of production. And, um, and the, the non-communists had these large areas of, uh, of rural land. So they had the majority of the land, belonged to the anti-communists, but that didn't matter because they had, uh, the communists had all the cities, all the production centers. So the um, white army had to rely on allies to supply their, their ammo and things like that. Um, so that's something to think about. I mean, that, that kind of has implication for today, if you think about it. But um, mo more importantly, um, the, the, the red army had a, had a better propaganda machine. They, they were able to convince the common people way better than, than the anti-communists. Um, and if you look at propaganda posters of the time, they they were often very short, very um, very easy to understand, very convincing, all at once, just in a very simple statement. And that's that's what you see in these quality bumper stickers. It's just a symbol. But and so the the, the left in our society, I think, does a way better job of communicating and attracting people to their ideas than than uh, conservatives and Christians, I think. And um, so they had a way better propaganda, uh, uh, way, they were way better at convincing people of their position. 
And also they were they they won the common and this is kind of on the same point, but they won the they won the peasants, they won the common people. Um, and that had to do with uh, convincing them that that they actually had their best interests in mind. That if they accepted communism, they would be better off. But it also had to do with the fact that they drove the white army to uh, to do terrible things, and the white army uh, were. They destroyed the. They they plundered. They um, they mistreated people, and it caused the common people to not to not trust them. And um, and so I think if we're going to win this, we need to find a way to very simply and um, and winsomely show people that there's a better way towards justice. There's a better way towards. Um, all the things that these people actually want. They want justice, they want people to thrive. And we just need to show them that there's a better way to achieve those things. And that's what I've tried to give you guys in, um, in these lessons. I've tried to show you, I've tried to give you something very, very simple that you can use to not only recognize any form of critical theory, not just critical race theory, not only recognize it, but understand it and refute it. So I, I think what I've given you here in these, in these three things will allow you to do that. So, yeah, and I, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the things that, uh, so just some su suggestions that I had. And I want to go over this a little bit today. Um, but in the resources, I provided something called Village Politics by Hannah Moore. There's a link to it. I wasn't able to find a PDF. Have you guys ever heard of Hannah Moore? Okay, she was a friend of William Wilberforce. That was the, um, the, the, the man who led the charge in Great Britain against slavery. And uh, he had a group called the Clapham Sect, which was a group of Christians that, did, uh, that devoted themselves to doing good in society. And um, they, they started... In, in, uh, they were part of the, the movement of, um, of starting Sunday school. That they wanted to actually provide school to kids that couldn't obtain it. Uh, but anyway, she wrote, a, she wrote a, a pamphlet called Village Politics. And if you read this, you, you'll be amazed that it's how similar it is to our current situation because they, this was written during, uh, right before the French Revolution happened. So there, was, there were all these revolutionary ideas being talked about. And she wrote this pamphlet in response to those ideas. And sh so she said, we don't need the, that, what, they're, what they're doing over there. We don't need what they're doing over there in France. Um, so she was talking about how we don't need the kind of equality that they want. And she called it, she called it leveling. That's what she called the, their version of CRT, or their version of critical theory. She said, we don't need leveling. And that, that term is, is an actually, it's, it came from um, the century prior, during the English Civil War. And um, there was a form of communism even then, that, and they called them levelers because they wanted to level men's estates. And uh, so they called that leveling back then. And I, w I would submit that, that that's actually a really great name for this entire family of beliefs, this entire ideology that says that, no, 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 the, these, views, these very normal and healthy views are oppressive. We need to level all of that. And we need to make everything equal. So if you read, it's, it's, it's really worth reading in a lot of different ways. And I think her use of the term leveling is, is, is actually very, very apt. It makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, because the game right now is that, and I, I hear this over and over again, the game right now is just to say that, that critical race theory is a boogeyman that has been invented by the right. And um, it doesn't really exist. There's, you know, what they, what they say they're teaching in elementary schools, they're not really teaching. And so, if we can bring it back to these main issues, if we, can, if we can bring it back to the actual content of what this thing is teaching, what this ideology is teaching, um, 
I think that will, that will get us in a step in the right direction. So uh, I want to just go over this a little bit, and then I want to talk about, um, I'm going to make you guys aware of some of their tactics, because uh, I think that's valuable as well. And you guys, again, you guys can stop me if you have anything to say. Uh, we talked about this last time. So, uh, so I gave some suggestions about how to win. And I think winning strategy is, um, is again, to, to be motivated out of love, to, to win this person back from a very harmful belief system and not just to win a debate. I think it's really, really important to have our minds and hearts there, to be driven by love, not by... Um, not resentment or anything like that. And I, another winning strategy, it, really important to bring it back to the main issues. So uh, we're talking about, we're actually talking about these things and not something else. I gave a lot of examples of that throughout this course. Um, there was a question asked last week. Pastor Ross asked, okay, how would you refute this? How would you refute their because this is basically at the core of what they believe. They want to make everything equal. They don't think that treating people equally is enough. They want to make everything equal, equal results, equal outcome. And um, I suggested that, that the main issue here is, is about showing them that their version of equality, their equal results is not right. It's not biblical. It's not what justice is. And... Um, and then Pastor Ross pointed out, and I think this is really good, that this entire picture actually presents the wrong, the wrong interpretation of reality in general. So, um, you know, if, if, you look, if you take uh, trans issues as the example, think about what does it mean to see the game, right? Because in this picture, everyone wants to see the game. They're just trying to get over the fence to see the game. And again, I told you guys that the, the using trans issues as an example is really great because you can easily see what's wrong and where this is wrong. So what is seeing the game for a trans person? And the, the answer is that a trans person wants to, um, want society to be, wants our beliefs about gender to be different in society so that they can be treated as normal. That's really what they want. So that's what seeing the game means for them. In which case the fence would represent our basic beliefs about gender. And, um, if you look at some of their other pictures, the ultimate goal is not just to see over the fence, it's to remove the fence. And so the whole idea about, you know, some people have undue benefits in society, like, uh, you know, cis people have undue benefits in society because um, they're benefiting from an oppressive belief system that says that, only, that there's only males and females. Um, and that's why some people are benefiting over others. And that's, that's just completely wrong. On every single level, it's wrong. I mean, a better picture, in, a better picture probably would be if, uh, maybe if you, just off the top of my head, if you had a path and there were two guardrails, maybe there was a cliff on one side, cliff on the other, right? And maybe some people are farther along on the path than others, right? Maybe that would represent the fact that we have, there are, di there are inequalities in society, not necessarily a bad thing. But that sometimes people end up outside the boundaries that God has set and it causes harm in their own lives. Maybe that's a better picture than this, of representing what's actually going on, right? So, uh, yeah, I gave you guys some questions to ask, and we talked a little bit about the, um, the Bible verses that show that what they want is not, is not good, it's not biblical. Okay, I want to make you aware of some of their, some of their tactics. So I think I put these into categories. I just want to, I, I kind of compiled a list of things that they will do to, to convince people, to drag them into their belief system. Uh, I've called this before, I've called this tactic system the bite because when people are bitten by this, it's almost like a prank right anymore. I think your rights are under assault because you don't want to share the democracy with others. So this is an accusation. Uh, a lot of their arguments come in the form of accusations. 
And uh, another one is by denying trans people their rights, you're basically saying they don't exist. That's a very, very common, um, common argument. And uh, what I would do with accusations is I would just ignore them. I would just ignore them. I wouldn't even respond to them. I would just, I would just state what your beliefs are about trans people, for example. Uh, or what your beliefs are about uh, whatever the case is in this first point. You know, if you're talking about race, just state what you believe the issues are. Because, um, guys, especially if you look at this first example, this is a tangled mass of nonsense. Right? Because you don't want to share the democracy with others. Well, that's a false accusation. And then what, it, and then what they mean by to share the democracy with others, that's not what I would consider sharing. Right? So there's just, it's a tangled mass of nonsense. Just don't even deal with it. Um, just state what your, what your views are. So another category that they have is that they try to dissolve your defenses. And um, this comes in a lot of different forms. So that one of them is that uh, they say that you don't, if you're uncomfortable with all this, maybe you're, you're a white person hearing that you're contributing to an oppressive system and that you're, you are benefiting, you have, un, you have unearned privileges that you have, that white people have achieved unjustly. And that natural, when you bring that up to somebody, it naturally makes them uncomfortable. And, and they'll say, don't, don't avoid the discomfort. Lean into the discomfort. Or they might say, don't take this as an insult. It isn't your fault. This is just how white supremacy works. So you see what they're trying to do. They're trying to get around your, because you naturally have a reaction to this stuff. And you say, like, what I'm hearing is wrong. And they're trying to provide an explanation for why you, why you feel that way. So that they can more easily... Um, they can more easily tell you what their, what their views are. And then you need to, uh, another one is you need to listen to people who have different perspectives than you. And these are all ways of, of, of breaking down your natural response that says that th there's something that I'm hearing here that isn't right. Another one is, uh, I mentioned this before, but I meant, uh, there's something called the Mott and Bailey fallacy, where they will uh, protect a weak claim behind a strong one. So an example is that the, um, the weak claim that they want, that they don't really want to say outright, that they, they'll say it when they're honest, but they, won't, they, they, they often won't want to say it outright, so they say, we need to change the culture so no group has a different experience at this organization. So really what they're saying is we want equality. We want uh, a radical kind of equality. The strong claim that they hide it behind is that everyone should feel like they belong here. Very, very common. So hide a weak claim behind a strong claim. Mott and Bailey. And then um, the last one is, is circular reasoning. So you might try to provide them with reasons why their beliefs are not right. And they will, they will just say, well, what you're saying is white supremacy. What you're saying is racism. That's, that's systemic racism. That is, um, that's hateful. That's homophobic. That is transphobic. That's misogynistic. And that puts them in a really dangerous position because they can't get out of this. They can't get out of that circular type of thinking. Every time they hear good, sound reasoning, they think, no, that's white supremacy. So these are some of their tactics. And um, the way that I've gotten around all of these is just to continually bring it back to the main issues. Continually bring it back to the main issues. And there was a, um, I guess I can give you guys an example. There was a, a trans activist that I was talking to. Uh, it was on the subject of, of, um, Inclusive language, like uh, chest feeding instead of breastfeeding, and um, birthing parents, right? So I, I was just I, I just talked to this person, and I really I'm going to use the the pronoun uh, he because I really believe that this was a a man pretending to be a woman. Um, so the first thing I did was I, I like to I like to just state their beliefs back to them in this form because that will get us talking about the right thing. And I say, well, so let me, just help me with something. I love to, I love to use that, 
that, uh, that starter in the conversation, because just, just help me with this. I'm really having a hard time understanding this. Um, I just need some help understanding this. So I said, Does it, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that, is that uh, not using inclusive language is harmful and it, it's, it's oppressive to trans people. And I said, this is, this is like, this is parallel to systemic racism where, um, you know, white supremacy has, just like white supremacy has to be dismantled, uh, this, this whole cis normativity, like the, the, the male and female being normal, that also has to be dismantled. And inclusive language is a way to do that. I said, do I have that right? And, um, and he said, he said, yes. Uh, not, it's, it's the same with all marginalizations and not using inclusive language is absolutely, he said, absolutely oppressive to trans people. And um, he said it's the same with all marginalizations, whether it's you know, race or gender or whatever. And um, he said, uh, oh, that, that, that was what it was. He said if, if you're not actively against it, in other words, if you're, not, if you're not a part of the revolution, you are passively for it. And so if you guys have heard, have heard the phrase, silence is violence, that's what, that's what he was saying. That you have to either be, uh, you're either an ally, you're an anti-racist, or you're part of the problem. Which is a very communist thing to say. <laughs> very communist thing to say. Um, so that kind of thing gets us on the right foot. And then I, then I said, uh, well, oppression is, is worldview. It depends on your worldview. That, like, the way that you view oppression depends on your worldview. What you consider to be oppressive. Um, because who determines that? Who determines the way that the body is supposed to work? Who determines the way that gender is supposed to work? Right? Doesn't that depend on your, on your view of the world? Uh, and that, that's going to get us thinking about all of these things, all of these, these issues about what, what is oppression, what is justice, what is right and wrong, how do I view the world rightly? And, um, and he said, well, I, I think science should determine that. I think science should determine that. And I... And, uh, and I started to talk about Christians. I said, you know, Christians, Christians think inclusive language is actually harmful. That if I, use inclu if I say birthing parent, that's actually harmful to everybody. <laughs> it's not liberating. It's actually harmful. Uh, and so we talked about that for a little while. And I think he, what he ended up saying is that, well, I, I'm thankful that, Christians don't deter that Christianity doesn't determine the laws. You know? and, then, and then that can get us talking about, well, what should determine laws? Because you're going to use your views to determine laws. Why can't Christians use their views? Because you have to have a basis for these things. You, you, you have to approach all of these issues from a certain worldview. And, um, yeah, so he said, thankfully, Christians don't determine our laws, or Christianity doesn't determine our laws. And, um, you know, he was going down the science route to determine our laws. And, um, I said, well, you, 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 th but this brings up a point that you can't center, you can't bring everybody into the center. Because they say that part of liberation is that you need to take the people at the margins and you need to put them in the center. It's called centering the marginalized. And I said, you can't center everybody. It's nonsense because if we use inclusive language, you're, cent you're, you're marginalizing all the people that think that's harmful. And um, so I'm just trying to point out that, that this, is, this, this, this is incoherent. It's incoherent. It's nonsense. And um, what was really interesting about that, it's, he said at some point that, well, if we, dismant if we dismantled all of our language, society would crumble. <laughs> and like, you know, that's a really interesting point. Uh, but then he also said, um, just, we're, we're just, and then he brought it back to what I told you he was going to say. He said that uh, we're just trying to make people feel included. We just want people to feel included. I mean, what's wrong with that? And, um, and I don't buy that for one minute. That's not all you're trying to do. You're trying to dismantle our, our basic beliefs about gender. So um, I said, well, let's just be specific. What if a nurse, what if a Christian nurse decided not to use the inclusive language? Would that be okay? And he said, well, it's my opinion that if you can't, if your beliefs don't allow you to do, to do your job, <laughs> then maybe you should pick a different job. And uh, that's where he decided to, I'm out of here, I'm not talking anymore. Um, 
but that's what I try to do. I try to bring things back to these things, these philosophical things. And um, you guys had some questions last week about, well, can I, can I bring up facts? Can I argue why they're, um, you know, maybe um, to use an example from race, maybe uh, can I argue? Can I use facts and statistics to argue that that uh, these disparities are not due to racism? They're actually due to maybe people's different choices. Um, I think that's that's good. If you want to go that route, that's fine. Um, you just need to realize that you can make fact, you can make statistics say anything, and that's why I tried to warn you guys that. That, using, that arguing principles, I think, in my opinion, just like I just showed you with that example, is better than arguing facts. Um, <clears throat> now, I think, if you're gonna argue facts, it should be, your goal in arguing facts should be to show them what their interpretation of the world is. Rather than just use facts to show them that they're wrong, show them that, they're, that, that's part, that, that their wrongness is actually part of a larger wrongness to show them that their worldview itself is actually wrong. Right, that viewing uh, every police shooting against a black man as, a ra as, a, as an expression of a racist system is actually an incorrect way to view the world. So if you're gonna argue facts, it's great. I just think that my advice to you is to bring it back to their interpretation of reality and to show them, to, to use their wrongness as an example of, of, their, of their overall worldview. You guys got any thoughts? Because I feel like I've just talked for a long period of time. Um, if you guys got any questions, feel free to, to chime up. Um, yeah. The way that I love to bring the gospel into these conversations, and um, even if they don't receive it, when I have conversations with these people, I often get to preach the gospel to them multiple times because I will say, I think this is what you're saying, is that right? And they say yes, and then I say, well, this is what I think. <laughs> and then I can show them what the gospel says. And um, I do that with, with every belief system. Yeah, I do that with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, I, I say, well, this is what this is what the Bible says. And um, yeah, I think that's great. I mean, this, is, this, this provides a really, really great uh, platform to preach the gospel. It really does. Because, for example, um, you can show them that, um, I'm trying to pick a good one. Uh, how, about, um, how about rape or toxic masculinity? So feminists, Feminists will say that, that rape is due to our beliefs about gender, right? That, that, um, and I talked a little bit about this last week with Baby, It's Cold Outside, but feminists say that, that men in our society are trained to believe that they're, um, they are entitled to women's bodies. That's part of the oppressive misogynistic system, the belief that men are entitled to women's bodies. And um, that's where rape comes from. And you can tell them that, like, look, that's... This is, not a, this is not a cultural thing. Rape is not a cultural thing. Rape is a sin thing, and it's a human thing. And the, the cure is not to level some level society. The, the cure is the gospel, is, is uh, bring, being reconciled to God through Christ. So, um, yeah, that's good. I like that. Because your world is your presupposition. Yep. And you should not shy away from your own presuppositions, right? Because that's all you're standing on. Why would you give up the Bible, right? If you try to argue from fact alone as if there's some neutral ground that we can argue from, that's a mistake. It's a mistake. Argue from the scriptures. Because you have to have some, some basis to determine right and wrong, right? So when, the, when, this, um, when this person asked me or, or said, I'm really glad that Christianity doesn't determine laws, it's okay to talk about that, that we have to have some basis for our laws. It's a really, it's really a mistake to try to argue from some neutral, neutral position. Yeah, that's where the, the law comes from. The law comes from the scripture. I mean, it's, it's yeah. I've heard people uh, use 
the argument that we're supposed to treat that there seems to be the male nor female um, barbarians getting in and slave or free, you know, and, and, and they twist that verse and that scripture to speak of, well, we need to kind of break down all the barriers. Obviously, the Lindsay panel would treat that that scripture is speaking of when it comes to we're all equal in the sight of God and salvation is for everybody, not just a certain group. But I've heard the argument of using that verse to say we need to break down all the barriers and all all the things that separate these different groups kind of thing. So I, I have heard that argument. I don't know how big that is um, even in the Christian. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I usually hear, to be honest with you, I usually hear our side use that to tell them that we shouldn't be breaking people up into different groups, right? Because if I go to church with... Um, if I'm supposed to view the black people in my church as an oppressed class, right? I have, to, I have to view them through this lens. I have to say that, oh, they're oppressed by the white supremacist system. That's going to change the way that I relate to them, right? So that, but the, the gospel says that there's no male or female, there's no, there's no black or white, right? We're all one in Christ. So I, I've, I've honestly, I don't really hear uh, these people really use that that often. I really hear the other side use that. Um, but that, I mean, they could, I can imagine a thousand different ways that you can misuse scripture. Um, I mean, the New Agers say that Jesus, that the scriptures teach that manna from heaven was a hallucinogenic mushroom. <laughs> and so you can twist scripture into any to say anything, you know. So um, knowing the scriptures is is really great. But what what, what did I want to think? One of the things I want to tell you. Because I, I want to leave you with the thought that this thing can be beat. It can be. We are in the best position to do that as Christians. Um, and um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Because you were saying that uh, you can, you know, we can twist scripture. Oh, that um, we have to think these things through. That's, that, this thing can be beat. We need to do it as Christians. Um, and we, we're in a really good position to do it. And... Um, we need to think these issues through. So if we know our, our it, it, and this should provide a super great opportunity to just learn our Bibles better, right? So when you encounter other beliefs, it should drive you not to, to react and ignore it, but to go back to the scriptures and say, how do I know that I'm right about this? And when we do that, I think it's just going to make us that much stronger. So just like the Bible says that, all, that God causes us to triumph in every situation, I think we can use this as an opportunity that God can use, that God uh, we'll use this as an opportunity to strengthen his church um, as we learn to think through these issues. Yeah, so I wanted to encourage you guys to, to practice doing this because the only way to get better at this is to practice. So I, I would encourage you to read their stuff. Read, uh, read stuff from, um, from woke publications and podcasts. Uh, listen, to, listen to woke podcasts. Uh, the best way by far is to challenge yourself by talking to people, even if it's online, and, um, and just finding people that think like this and just talk to them. Because what you'll, what you'll find is that some of the arguments that you thought were really good, they're going to come back and say things that you did not expect. And uh, it will force you just to get better and stronger. So that by far that is the best way to get better, is to talk to people. Um, so apply our model of critical theory to what you encounter. I really think that if every time you read an article or listen to a, uh, a podcast or something like that, uh, bring it back to the model that we talked about in this class because I think it can really help you understand it and refute it. And then uh, the last one is meditate on, script, on what scripture says about the core claims being made. And I think I already made that point. So um, yeah, so my, 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 um, my hope is that this is, not, this is not the end of this conversation, that this is just the beginning for the people in our, in our church. You guys got any other thoughts? Okay. All right, I think I'm done then. <laughs> oh, and I, yeah, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And I also want to thank uh, I want to want to thank Kurt um, for doing the for doing the video and the um, the tech stuff. So thanks for doing that. <laughs>